It's almost four weeks now that we've been celebrating the televised daily mass in St. Basil's Church on the campus of St. Michael's College in the heart of downtown Toronto. St. Basil's has loomed large in my life for a very long time. In the 1950s, when I was a diocesan seminarian and an undergraduate at St. Michael's, I used to visit it on a regular basis for a moment of prayer. On Sunday evenings, the seminarians, who at that time had most of their liturgical celebrations in the seminary chapel, gathered here for a holy hour. I can still remember the Brazilian priests and professors preaching on those occasions. Last year, St. Basil's marked its 150th anniversary. Although built initially as a place of worship for the priests and students of the adjacent college, it functioned from the beginning as a parish church for the few Catholic families who lived in what was then the outskirts of the city. This dual nature of St. Basil's as collegiate and parish church has continued throughout its history. Over the course of the last several decades, a new dimension has been added to its identity. St. Basil's is now surrounded by a forest of tall apartment and condominium buildings, as well as by a variety of government and business offices. The church is located within a short walking distance of Young and Bloor, a crossroads of two of the city's main streets, as well as of its north, south, and east-west subways. Included in the parish boundaries are Queen's Park, the site of the provincial government, the University of Toronto, and such upscale shopping areas as Yorkville. During the week, St. Basil's now serves people from all over the city. Built in an English Gothic style with a rather solid bell tower and soaring spire, St. Basil's is a striking presence not only for those who work and live and study at the college, but also for the surrounding city. For neighbors and passers-by alike, its copper-covered steeple is a gentle reminder that there are other things to life besides business and pleasure. St. Basil's has always been an important part of St. Michael's College, I remember coming into the church during my undergraduate years and seeing distinguished lay professors like the great historian of philosophy, Etienne Gilson, and Marshall McLuhan kneeling in prayer. The example of these and others inspired many young men and women to commit themselves to a serious intellectual as well as a spiritual life. There's something about St. Basil's that makes it conducive to prayer. Its size and furnishings is rather, are rather modest. Although its walls are somewhat stark, the feeling that the place generates is one of warmth and reflection. It invites people to be still and to listen, to listen to one's heart, and in it to discern the quiet voice of God. The fact that I've been presiding over the weekday 7 o'clock mass for the last eight years has brought me into a whole new relationship with St. Basil's. Attendance at that early hour varies from about 30 to 50 people. Although many of us have never spoken to one another, and although we come from different social, ethnic, and cultural backgrounds, we have a sense that in our coming together, we become a community. In some strange way, the physical character of the church facilitates that process. It creates an atmosphere into which we all enter and by entering, draw closer to one another. I recently told a non-religious colleague in the university about my involvement in the morning mass at St. Basil's. His reaction surprised me. What a wonderful way to start the day, he said. He was right. It is a wonderful way. At 7 o'clock in the morning, downtown Toronto, although stirring to life, is still relatively quiet. For those of us who gather at St. Basil's, the day begins with silence and prayer. 
and with the Eucharist. Such a beginning can't help but give a distinctive perspective to all that will follow. Because my life as a priest has been lived not in a parish or on the missions, but in a classroom and in a university office, morning mass takes on for me a special meaning. It's the most explicitly priestly act of my day. It's not, however, something that I would do or that I want to do by myself. And so I'm grateful for the small community of people who gather so faithfully in this church, summer and winter, in every kind of weather. The particular focus of my responsibility in the Eucharist is twofold. The first has to do with the liturgy of the word and especially with the homily. Given that people are on their way to work and elsewhere, what can be done at morning mass has to be brief no more than three minutes. A homily, however, always demands preparation. And so my day begins the evening before when I read over the text and try to discern in them something that might be of help to my fellow worshipers. The effort involved in that means that most often I benefit from the homily more than anyone else. The second action that defines the priest's role in the Eucharist is the proclamation of the Eucharistic prayer. To be able to do this is for me an enormous gift. In it, we make memory of Jesus and of his death and resurrection and what God has done for us through them. And we do this in the context of a great prayer of praise and thanksgiving. In recalling and rendering present among us the self-offering of Jesus, we offer ourselves with him. We do so because we know that we have come from God and belong to him. This is the deepest and often forgotten meaning of everything else that we will do in the course of the day. The daily morning celebration in St. Basil's has given me a greater love and appreciation for this church. It has become in a new way, a spiritual home, a place where God dwells and where we are invited to encounter him. I hope that something of that experience will come to be shared by those of you participating in our celebrations in your homes. One of the wonders of television is its ability to enable us to become part of events taking place at a great distance. May you become part of the great tradition of those who over the last 150 years have gathered to pray and to worship in this church. May it help all of us deepen our sense of community. Let us now in faith and trust present before God our needs. For all of us that are sharing in this Eucharist will renew our commitment to prayer and to the community of faith. Let us pray to the Lord. For the victims of the fires in California that they will have the courage and the help they need to rebuild their lives. Let us pray to the Lord. For Canadian soldiers serving in Afghanistan, that their efforts will contribute to the building up of a peaceful and just society in that country, let us pray to the Lord. For all those who share in this Mass by television and who have phoned or written in asking for our prayers, let us pray to the Lord. For our deceased relatives and friends and for those who have died this night, that they will be brought to eternal life in God, let us pray to the Lord. Gracious God, we ask you to hear and grant these prayers as well as the more personal ones that each one of us has in his or her own heart. All this we pray through Christ our Lord. 